Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first series, our first session of our um, monthly series, Conversations with an Author. Um, welcome to the ASC Writing Center here at the South Campus. And we are going to be featuring our very own Professor Alyssa Albo. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Professor Albo is a local South Florida author who has had her works featured in numerous journals and anthologies, including Alimentum, Bomb Magazine, Crab Orc, Orchard Review, Gulfstream Magazine, International Literary Quarterly. She was born in Havana, raised in Central Florida. She received her MFA from Florida International University, and she currently teaches English and ESL courses here at Broward College. Can we give a warm welcome to yeah. Professor Elisa Alba, our teacher. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, and thank you all so much for coming. I think I'll have a seat. Sure. <laughs> Get thank you, Marshall, for yeah. putting this together and, and doing this for the students. This is just lovely, and it's great to see all of you here. So thanks for coming. So I'm here to talk about the writing process and uh, where, where not just poems because all of you may write different things, but you know where your creativity comes from. Um, does anybody write poems here? Sometimes. Nobody writes poems. Does anybody write songs or stories? So you're interested in creativity, uh, ideas, writing, extra credit. <laughs> okay. All right, well, it doesn't matter because it's the kind of thing that um, is helpful to everyone and I think it's helpful to your life in so many ways. You know, where do we get ideas? Um, where does it come from? How, um, how do we develop it? You know, someone mentioned, I don't see him here, but he says, what if you get stuck? You know, what do you do? Um, and uh, I find, you know, just actually preparing for today, I realized was a process. And I imagine many of you are familiar with the writing process, um, who've taken composition classes. Um, and I've taught it for many, many years, more than 25 years, actually right here at South Campus. And if it's, you know, the writing process has taught me anything, it's that everything is a process, that life is a process. And the wonderful thing about that is that you can rely on the process. You don't always have to be perfect, you know, from the start, because everything has to start somewhere. And then you, um, you develop and you add and you revise and you edit. In fact, I have a little poem I'm gonna read you that I put those two things together and how we're kind of always doing that in our lives, you know? We're always improving and adjusting and, and uh, doing what we can to, to get to, to our goals or to feel better and, and things like that or to create. So I'm gonna be covering a lot of those things. I brought a little show and tell um, over here also. And um, one of the first questions that students also often ask me, and by the way, I do teach uh, creative writing here and again, it's good for students who, not just because you write poetry, mine is specifically poetry, but a lot of mm -hmm. students take that who just want to improve their writing or their creativity, um, you know, their, their thought process to be more creative. And that course definitely does that. Um, and I am teaching one next semester, so if you're interested, uh, let me know afterwards and I'll be happy to tell you about it. Um, and also, even in like composition courses, you know, I always start out with certain basics. Um, students are always like, oh my god, what am I going to write about, you know? Um, they feel like they don't, you know, my life is not that interesting necessarily, or I don't have material. And the first thing I tell them is, you all have material. You are all a font of material. And you have that material, that material because uh, first of all, um, you are all living, you know, and so you have these lives, you have childhoods, 
Your childhood, you could write about your childhood for the rest of your life. There is so much material there. Many of our students, many of you possibly are from other countries, um, so you've had experiences. Um, all of the roles that you play in life, you're, you know, you're possibly, you're a student, you're possibly a parent, you're somebody's child, um, you may be taking care of somebody. Um, all of those things provide uh, material. Uh, your memories, everything that you've done, your experiences, many of you work also, or have had certain life experiences, and all of that is material as well. Now, how do we tap into all of that? Um, oh, and I'm going to add your dreams also. We all dream, and a lot of times we can get material from there as well. So all of these places, our life, our experiences, our memory, um, also our observations. How many of you consider yourself pretty observant? Do you watch what's going on around you, or do you kind of go through life like this? <laughs> um, so sometimes I think a lot of people go through life with blinders on, you know, they don't really kind of look around and like really look at things. Um, and not just what's there, but also what's not there. A lot of times we don't ask, that's like a whole other world when you ask what is not there, or what is not happening. Um, I remember once I was driving through Miami Beach with my sister and I said, you know, the, the guy that owns that gas station has 21 children all by the same wife. And he's like, how do you know that? I said, I talked to him. <laughs> you know? When I went there, I stopped there once, I talked to him. Um, and, uh, you know, that's material. That's a kind of informal research that we can do. Um, I urge you all to speak to, you know, your parents if you have them or your grandparents. Um, a lot of times there's um, a lot of material there that if you don't ask, you are not going to find out. Um, my dad always talked a lot about his life. Uh, my parents were immigrants and, uh, you know, they had to start over in this country and, and uh, my dad was a doctor and, and I knew a lot about him because he would talk about it. But my mother, not a word. And one time I was, I was writing a poem about, um, about the family and how they came over and she happened to come over from Spain because she was born there and, uh, and from there she went to Cuba. And so I decided to ask her directly, and I said, you know, what was it like? Because I knew she came over at eight years old on a ship. I said, what was it like? And my mother, who's a huge reader, um, but like I said, doesn't really uh, volunteer a lot of information, she said, it was like the Titanic. She said, the rich people were at the top and the rest of us were on the bottom. <laughs> And I thought, wow, she speaks in metaphors, you know, and in similes. And so she's a woman of few words, but, but she could tell me exactly. And with that, she gave me exactly, you know, I understood exactly what she was saying. And then she added, um, it was the first time I ate white bread and marmalade. And if I hadn't asked her, I wouldn't have gotten that detail, you know, those details. And those details, you know, went into my poems, um, and they make it come alive, and they make it real, right? Um, so how do we tap into all that? We're going to talk about um, some of that. Um, can anyone tell me how we experience the world, like, physically, how we experience it? Through our senses. Through our senses, exactly. So what we see, right? Um, but also what we hear, what we smell what we taste and what we touch, what we feel. If you did not experience the world through your senses, you wouldn't even know you were alive. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to experience it through the senses. And you can develop those senses. You can make yourself more sensitive. Um, the world is very sensual in the sense that it's full of sense experience. And again, you know, we want to talk about how to tap into that in order to be able to describe it and, and detail it. But you also want to experience it. Um, the more you experience it, the more you will um, be able to tap into it. And a lot of times, you know, we look at something, but we don't really look at it. You know, look at the texture and look at the pattern and, and feel it. You know, what does it actually feel? How many of you, when was the last time you touched a tree? <laughs> Anybody remember the last time you touched a tree? So um, I actually touched, I hugged a tree um, recently because I have these 
three trees in, on my swale in front of my house and they've just like really been growing the last couple years and I just I have a thing about trees because trees to me they they look like bodies they look like um, you know like arms and, and stretching out and and so I'm and I just I just love trees I have a few tree bones um, there's just something about them um, and, and I actually decided to, to just, I was standing on the sidewalk and I'm like, okay, my neighbors are gonna think I'm crazy, but I am going to touch this tree and hug this tree. And so I could, you know, it has a really interesting surface on it that I wouldn't experience if I didn't get that close to it and touch it. And um, uh, that kind of thing, putting yourself in those situations, um, you know, breaking out of your habits. If you drink coffee every day, you know, have tea one day, you know, just change it up. Um, making yourself really look at something, uh, sometimes stopped at a stop, and not always a screen, okay, I will add that this time. Um, this is a way that you become aware of, you develop your senses, you know, the more you look. I dated um, uh, an artist many years ago, and I remember once we went to the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and we sat in front of a Miro, the Spanish artist Miro, um, a painting and you know and I'm fine I, I look at paintings I can look for five minutes you know and we sat there and he sat there and he did not move a muscle for 30 minutes okay for 30 minutes he just stared at this painting and it taught and so I did too um, and it, it taught me something you actually can develop your eyes um, I love art and so I, I go to a lot of museums I look at a lot of art I look at a lot of things and, um, and I feel like, you know, I have developed my eyes over the years so that when I look at this rug, you know, there's, I see the pattern in the rug and if I keep looking at it, I'm, I start to see like, there's a cityscape in this, there's like cities in this rug. If you look at, it's like buildings, right? I mean, the more you look at something and the more you, you think of, of these things, the more you, you will actually see that. And then of course, you know, when you write, you're going to um, try to describe that. Um, and we can talk a little bit about, about how do you do that. Um, but first I wanna talk about something else that I think is really important to, to creativity and to writing in particular, and that is reading. Um, how many of you consider yourself readers? Okay, a few of you, good. Um, and do you read like one kind of thing or do you like to read a lot of different kinds of things? What do you like to read? I like different kind of things. Different? Do you read stories or poems, news? Correct. Okay, anybody read novels? Do you read novels? Okay. I mean, I, I mostly kind of, I mostly, you know, write poetry and so I read a lot of poetry, um, but I read all kinds of other things. And the thing about reading is that you get a lot of material from reading. Um, Fortunately and unfortunately, we cannot experience everything in the world, nor would we want to. You know, there's a lot of negative things too, so we don't want to, and we can't. Like, I would like to travel the world, but there's no way I'm going to go to every country in the world at this point. But I can read about it, and I can go online, and you can go into museums online, like any, you wanna go into St. Petersburg, Russia, to that museum? You can go there online, and you are limited at this point by your curiosity, just by your curiosity, because there, there is so much um, that you can visit and that you can experience and that you can read you know, that way. Um, but reading definitely will, will take you places. And since I mentioned that, I'm just going to go over here and um, show you. Um, I just brought some of my favorite um, uh, poetry books because I, I write poetry, so I read a lot of poetry. And I didn't bring some of the other things, but I, I'm always reading a novel. Um, I always have a novel going. The more you read, the more you realize that um, you need to get going, okay? <laughs> you need to get started because there is so much to read in the world. Uh, if you like a certain author, go and read everything that that author has written. You will become an expert on that author in a way that 95% of the population is not. Um, it's really very easy to become a Hemingway scholar. You just have to read everything he's written. And it's not really that much. A few novels, you know, a few stories. Um, so it's pretty easy to do that. Um, so these are, these are 
just some poets that, that I like and books that I keep going back to. All of these are, and we're going to look at a few poems from, from some of these books. Um, so we, I have like Thomas Lux, Jim Daniels, Lucille Clifton, um, Natasha Trathaway, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, and, um, and then also, any of you Neruda fans? Anybody read Pablo Neruda? Pablo Neruda is a Nobel Prize winning poet. He was Chilean. Um, and he is the most translated poet in the entire world because his writing is so concrete um, that it can be translated. And, um, and he's just a, a huge, even though I don't write almost anything like him, I have a couple of my, I call Neruda poems, but um, he's very lyrical. He expresses emotion. Um, I'm very narrative. I write a lot about story. So a lot of my writing are, are pretty much like little stories. Um, some of these, this is uh, a poet I discovered many years ago, uh, Lee Young Lee, is just a gorgeous, gorgeous poet. Um, and then this is someone I discovered just recently by going to um, a writing workshop, Gabrielle Calvo Caressi. And she turned me on to all kinds of things. And one of the exercises we did in her class was to take a poem of Lucille Clifton's that I already was familiar with and imitate that poem. And um, I may um, uh, show you that as well, because that's something you can do. That's a way to get yourself to write. But she's very interesting. I don't understand her completely, um, but you know that doesn't stop me from reading someone. Um, I keep going back to them, I read it out loud, that's a way to understand it also, and I want to understand it. Um, this is a, a local poet uh, who just published this, uh, Steve Cronin. I just went to a reading of his, actually my second reading of his. Um, he did one in Miami and then he did one in Fort Lauderdale this weekend. Uh, homage to Mistress Oppenheimer, and you might be able to guess from this that it has something to do with science, um, some of the things that that he writes about. He is, um, for some people, so difficult that he uses a PowerPoint when he does a reading and he puts the poem there and he really talks about it a lot. And then you start to get it. And I've just been reading his work over and over to understand it. And he actually inspired me to write a poem um, that was an imitation of one of his. It's not anywhere near, I think, <laughs> as, as good as his at this point. But, um, but that's a way to, to get ideas, is through reading. Um, I'll also, uh, since I'm up here, just go ahead and show you a few other things. Some of the magazines that uh, Marsha Lee mentioned, I actually brought some of the places where um, I'm published. Uh, and these are all older. The Crab Orchard Review, Connecticut River Review. Alimentum is a food journal, it's a journal of, of food. So everything is related to that, and that's one of my my topics. Writers write about their obsessions, you know, the things that they're interested in or obsessed with, and food is definitely one of mine. So this is a, a beautiful journal that no longer, uh, I was lucky to be published in the hard copy, now they're fully online, but if you Google Alimentum Journal, you will find it. it's a beautiful website, tons of poems, photography, um, and so uh, I might read something from that. And. Um, this is a little anthology, also Tiger Tell of South Florida Poetry Annual. There's, um, and you all can you know take a look at these uh, after. Gulfstream is actually the um, uh, journal of FIU of the uh, Masters of Fine Arts uh, Department, which is a creative writing degree. So I think this one, yeah, I don't, I, I have a review of of my little chapbook of my book uh, in this. Um, but I did publish a poem in one of those also. They rejected me about five times. That's a big part of publishing is getting rejected, you know. <laughs> you should wear it like a badge, you know. You should, not, you should not let it, you know, deter you or anything because so much of publishing is uh, just a matter of taste, you know. So you want to kind of read and, and see, well, they kind of write stuff like, they publish stuff like what I write, so then you send them. Um, but we can talk more about uh, publishing later if, if you're interested. All right, so um, that's enough talking. I think we should do some doing, <laughs> some writing. So um, I was just talking about um, reading, and a lot of times before I'm going to write, I read. 
Um, in fact, I, I like to do that. I read before I go to bed, and I and I read a lot of times if I wake up, if I don't have to grade 25 papers or um, you know rush to help a child or something. Um, uh, I love to you know one of the biggest luxuries is to stay in bed and read. Um, I love to do that, um, and it inspires me. Uh, I'll just start to read a poem, or, or it doesn't have to be a poem, and it'll give me, it'll tap into a memory of mine, and then I'll start writing my own. And uh, I can't tell you how many of, um, uh, of my poems have actually occurred that way. Um, I actually made a little handout for you of some of the things I'm talking about, and also, uh, I'll thank you. There are some, some poems here. I just give you one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's see if you have enough of those there. I have another. Okay. Everyone have one? Did you get one? All right, so these are just some of the things that I'm sort of going through right now, talking about getting inspired and, and reading and the writing process. Um, a lot of it is, um, you know, just doing it just starting somewhere and not trying to you know write the great american novel right off the bat not to do anything perfect because nothing comes out like that that's not the process that's not how art is created it takes time um you have to get away from it for a while you know you have to come back to it sometimes you just have to go live more and then come back to it and now you look at it with you know fresh um a fresh perspective or you know, especially if something's not working, you know, just leave it alone. Go do something else um, and then come back or go read something else. Um, so there's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's always something to write about. And, and how do we tap into it? Um, do any of you keep journals or have ever kept a journal or a diary? Anybody do that? A few of you? Okay, good. So um, this just happens to be one. I like these kinds of books sometimes. I've... I have stacks of spiral notebooks. I think those work best. Um, or the composition books, you know, the ones that are not spiral. Um, and a lot of times, it's funny, what I do with this one is the first half, I reserve it like to write new poems, new ideas. And then the second half, I'm actually doing like a journal where um, I will, you know, write about things that happened. Um, I encourage everyone to, to write down uh, to keep some kind of journal, because if you do not, you will forget the details of your life. And if you keep a journal, and you don't have to be a slave to it, you know, you just, whenever, it doesn't have to be every day, and you don't have to tell us you brushed your teeth, you know, we'll just assume that, okay? <laughs> but just like when stuff happens, you know, or you're feeling, I mean, a lot of times, I have journals where the writing's all crazy because I was upset about something, and so I'm writing it out, I really felt better after that, you know. You like, you you can work it out, um, and um, so I, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, this summer, I traveled with my family, and we did a, what we're calling a civil rights tour of the South. Um, we went up to Tallahassee first, just because we had to stop at a certain point from down here. Uh, but then we went to Alabama, and we went to Selma to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, we went to, um, uh, to Montgomery and saw the new museum there, which basically, you know, could be called a lynching museum, but it's, it's just an incredible memorial. I highly recommend everyone make this trip. Um, the Rosa Parks Museum is there in the same town, and we visit Martin Luther King Jr.'s, his first the first church where he um, where he preached for four years. Uh, and then from there we went to Atlanta and also went to his memorial there. Um, and you know, a lot of this was just incredible and overwhelming and um, there's a, an indoor museum associated with the memorial in, in Montgomery. And um, 
Um, and it basically uh, goes from uh, slave, um, you know, memorializing everything that has to do with slave, including like 3D, you know, um, virtual uh, people that you can talk to, and um, all the way to mass incarceration, because they see that as a progression, and that now this is a, a new kind of slavery. Um, and uh, it's just absolutely fascinating. And when I was there, um, uh, they have this one wall full of real signs that used to exist around the United States. And I, um, the museum is called the Legacy Museum uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. And I just wrote down the signs because there's a kind of poem called a found poem. Um, does anybody know what that is, a found poem? That's when you see something or you read something and all you have to do is write it down and you have the poem. Like you almost don't have to do anything to it. Um, so I just started writing down these, what these signs said. And I'll just read you a couple of them. Um, um, this one said, uh, no dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans. And this was 1929, El Paso, Texas. And then the next one, I don't like to say this, so I'll just say, no N-word, no Jews, no dogs. Um, we employ white help and cater to white people. So this was just this list. Um, waiting room for white only by order of police. White only, maids in uniform accepted. Showers, white officers and arrow going this way, uh, colored officers and arrow going that way. Department of Army. So I just listed these, and I'm going to, I actually haven't done it yet. When I, when I write something down, I put a circle um, until I type it up. When I type it up, I check it off. This is just a way to, to keep track of what I'm doing. Um, and the book got kind of messed up, and it's kind of journal and poems all over the place now, for the most part, but this is one I, um, I, I definitely want to do. Um, I had another one that I got from there, and I just, I had a little notebook in my purse, and I started like writing all this down, just waiting for someone to tell me I couldn't do it, but nobody did. So, <laughs> um, this is another found one that I, uh, and the one I told you just continues. Um, and some of them are very ironic, you know, like Clark's Cafe, all white help, a good place to eat. You know, and you're like, really? <laughs> um, but here was another one that was um, that uh, actually gave you the laws of each country, um, and it had to do with the legalization of white supremacy. Uh, I, I think maybe I'm calling it this: the legalization of white supremacy or a different kind of enslavement. And then these were all these signs by state. These were actual laws. Al uh, Alabama billiards. It shall be unlawful for a Negro and a white person to play together or in company with each other at any game of pool or billiards. This was an actual law and regulation. Nebraska, interracial marriages. Marriages are void when one party is a white person and the other is possessed of one eighth or more Negro, Japanese, or Chinese blood. Very yeah, very specific. Yeah. It is, it's very detailed. Um, and it just goes on like, and then I didn't continue writing the long ones, but I just listed them. And that's a kind of poem also, it's called the list poem, where you just list things. Maryland, steamboats. So they had like a regulation for steamboats. Texas, boxing and wrestling. Louisiana, circuses. Florida, electronic, uh, electric cars. Idaho, alcohol. Maryland, pregnancy. Kentucky, theater. Alabama, nursing. Missouri, education. California, interracial marriage. Atlanta, Georgia, baseball. Um, so these, all of them had, and I think I, you know, I wrote down other notes about that, but these are things I just, I just find and, uh, and I just read. Um, and then on the way back from, um, from that trip, we stopped in Central Florida to visit my mom, and then um, we were coming back to South Florida, and we stopped in the favorite Mexican restaurant that we have discovered in Avon Park, and it is, they just, it's incredibly authentic and just amazing. So now my kids are like, we have to stop there every single time. We now never stop at Dairy Queen, we always stop there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, 
we were eating. And it's mostly, you know, uh, people from around there uh, who are Mexican, who probably work in the area, uh, the whole place, it's a market also. And um, this uh, white family walked in and the girl, uh, the teenage daughter was wearing a Confederate flag on her t-shirt. And it was just such a shocking thing for me to see in that place when she walked in and the, and the family, I was observing them. And this is what you do when you write, you observe. I like to go into what I call my detach and observe mode, you know, where I am now detached and observing this situation. So the mother was like, they're all around a menu, and I can, you know, if I find the poem, I'll read it to you, but they're all around this menu, and the mother's eyes are like darting everywhere because it is all brown people all around her, and her eyes are just going everywhere. And then the father doesn't even look up. He's like a statue. He's just holding that and. And the daughter, I don't know what she was doing. She was standing there because, oh, I couldn't get my eyes off her T-shirt. You know, this huge Confederate flag. It just didn't go in this place. It felt like an affront. And the shirt said, um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's history, not hatred. And, you know, by the time I get to the end of my poem, I'm like, you know what? It's not really just history. <laughs> you know? um, and, and a lot of times, you know, when you uh, start to write something, you don't know what you're going to write about. You don't know where it's going to take you or what you're going to learn, um, but you know that there's something there because you feel it. And if you just write it, you will get to that. You will eventually discover what it is, why, you, why you're writing it in the first place. You'll figure that out. Um, but that's why you just you have to write. So I do you know, encourage you to, to keep a journal and to write you know, entries there. Um, and to, you know, we're just, you know, like I said, there's always something to write about um, and try to do it in, in detail. Um, uh, many writers and artists, they want to create, but they are not writers and artists until they actually do it, you know? <laughs> so you want to, to actually do that. Um, so what I want to do now is have you do a little kind of journal writing in a way, a little free writing. Are you all familiar with free writing? So this is where um, I'm going to actually give you some prompts and I want you to write down the beginning of the prompt and I don't want you to think about it too much. I just want you to go. And don't worry about you know, spelling, grammar. You have to do, and you have to do it fast because when you do it fast, you turn off the editor. The editor that says, oh, this is not nice, they will not like it, and that, that is the, the killer of creativity, okay? You have to get it all out. So open up your notebooks. If you need um, a pencil or a pen, you have that there. And I'm going to uh, do it with you because I make my students do this at the beginning of every semester, and I always do it with them also because any opportunity to do it is great. Thank you. So, I have a handy clock over there, so I'm going to give you a prompt, and I just want you, whatever comes into your mind, you know, just write it, just write it. You're not going to have to read it, there's no grade. Um, <laughs> so just, you know, just write. And uh, those of you who are observing, you can do it too, you know? <laughs> you can do it as well. And then, you know, I'll let you go for like a minute or so, and then I'll give you another one. And then just switch off to that. If you wanna leave a couple lines, you know, just, and then just switch off to that one. And I'm gonna do that a couple of times, okay? I'm getting rid of my thing. Um, is everybody ready? Yes. Okay, so I want you to write this down and then just go. I remember.
I'll never forget. I'll never forget. If I could go back, if I could go back,
every day and fill up a spiral notebook every month, you will change your life. That's the subject of a book called Writing Down the Bones. Those of you who are into this, write down that name. Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg. She gives you these short little chapters with prompts just to get you writing. She studied Zen Buddhism and she's uh, convinced that if you write these things down every day, you empty your mind, you, your memory, your thoughts, that you will affect the, the way your life is going and your mind. So, because this is how we learn what we think and what we feel. Unwritten thought is incomplete thought. A lot of times if we don't write it down, we don't know, really. So, um, how many of you wrote about something that when you started to write it, you had no idea you were gonna write that? Anybody? Okay. So that's really interesting. These are, when you do this and when you do it quick, you tap into your subconscious. And we have all kinds of things, worries and you know, schedules and all kinds of things in our mind that, um, that it, it's there. It might not be in the forefront, but it's there. And when you do this, you tap into that. How many of you wrote about a memory that surprised you? You didn't realize that that was, that was in there. Okay, a few of you. Okay, good. All right. Um, so, uh, how many of you think you might do this again? You might, uh, okay. And you don't need, you, first of all, you can use the same prompt, okay? The I remember prompt is a really, really good one. Um, when I do free writing with my students, uh, when we do a free free writing, that is, you know, in that case, I just tell them to start writing and don't take your hand off the page. And if you don't know what to write, just write. I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, this is dumb, I'm hungry. You know, write whatever comes into your mind. But just keep writing and eventually they tap into something. Um, and if it takes you, after five minutes, if you haven't tapped into something, you need to keep going. Like you need it, okay? <laughs> you need to do that. But some of them jump right into a topic. Um, and then other times you can do it with a prompt. Now, you know, for something creative, um, one of the things I've mentioned is that you, when you read, you get ideas. A lot of times I just read the first line of a poem and it taps into a memory and then I just go. My poems don't come out like poems, you know, they come out basically like almost like a free writing. Um, I mean, I'm doing them, you know, margin to margin, but, um, you know, when I type it up, it's going to look different. And then that's when I'll, you know, I might play with, with the line breaks or with something like that. Um, I just was going to try to find you an example somewhere. But um, they're, they're real messy. When, when I have a line through it, that means I've already typed it up. Like it's done. <laughs> um, but I, I go back and I actually rewrite them again. There's something that happens when you write by hand. Very few creative writers begin on the computer. Um, they do it by hand because there's something creatively that happens to your mind when you do it by hand. And, um, and so I find um, I will do it, I, will, I like to rewrite it by hand a few times. And then I get to a point where I need to see it typed up. I want to see it typed up. And you know, we're lucky in this day and age, I can play with the line lengths, with the forms, all kinds of things, because it's so easy. You know, when people were doing it on typewriters, it was, it was a lot more work. Um, but it's very easy to, to revise and all that. And then I print it out. And from that printout, um, and that I can show you also. I'll print it out, and then I will revise on the printout. And I will continue to, to revise on this. And then I'll go and fix it, and then I'll print it out again. And eventually I staple like a whole bunch of revisions if I want to keep them, um, because, uh, you know, I'm just continually revising. And I don't know when I'm finished. I mean, I have poems that, that I've published. These are my, my two chapbooks that I read them now and I want to take a pen to them. Um, there's a famous writer, uh, uh, Vol 
I think it was Valerie, actually, not Voltaire, one of those, with a V, a French writer, um, said that a poem is never finished. It had to be Valerie, because Voltaire was a philosopher, not necessarily a poet. So Paul Valerie, a poem is never finished, only abandoned. You know, you just decide that's it. I'm, I'm going to stop now. Um, but you know, over the years, I've been developing my editing eye more and more. So a lot of uh, editing is, is really cutting. And I'll see, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. And I learn, I learn that every day. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm always wanting to, to revise. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is uh, take a line, as I was mentioning. Uh, just find a good first line, you know, so if I, um, actually, you don't need to go there, you can look in your handout, um, and just on the, on the, pay, the front of your handout, um, at the bottom I say use first lines, just start with the first line and then write your own, but use their first line. Um, it's not really considered stealing, okay, there's a different definition for plagiarism in poetry. Um, and it is that uh, good writers or good poets uh, borrow, great poets steal, okay? <laughs> because um, it's considered an homage, like you're, you're when, when I borrow, like there's a poet that I borrowed the rhythm of this one line of hers in three different poems. It's not exactly her line, but I've actually taken the rhythm of her line, mm -hmm. and, um, and the, even the grammar in a way. And when other people read that, if they know her, they know that's what I'm doing. So I've already sort of, you know, done my work cited on that just by using it. Um, so a lot of times, another thing to do is to imitate, completely imitate a poem. Um, so if you look at um, the next page, the next few pages that you have here in the handout, I gave you a Natasha Trethaway poem um, and also a Lucille Clifton poem and then uh, a Lee Young Lee one. Um, let's look at the Lucille Clifton one uh, for a moment. Uh, it was a dream, just a short little poem. Um, Andrea, would you like a hand up? <laughs> so, um, I love Lucille Clifton. She, uh, you know, there's so many writers that I want to do what they do, but I don't. They're completely different. Uh, what can, just from looking at her poem, what's something that seems unique to her that's different from the way you usually see writing? There's something that's not standard there. Lowercase. Does she does not capitalize anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what did you say? Lowercase. Lowercase, that's right. She just doesn't capitalize, and that's it. Um, there are a couple of poets who are famous for that, but that's, that's what she did. Um, so notice this poem, um, It Was a Dream. Would someone like to read this for us? I've been talking a lot. I can hear someone else's voice. Anyone? <laughs> it was a dream in which my greater self was up before me, accusing me of my life with an extra finger, willing in a tear of way. Oh, what my day had come to. What? I played with her. Could I do? Oh, what could I have done? And she twisted her wild hair and sparkled her wild eyes and screamed as long as I could hear her. This, this, this. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, sometimes I have students, several students read it so that we can really understand it. And since this one's short, let's do someone else read it for us. Okay, thanks. In which my greatest self rose up before me. Okay, now you have to start with this one. You have to start with the title. Oh, okay. Because the title is the first line of the poem in this case. And that's something po poets do. Okay. <clears throat> it was a dream in which my greatest self rose up before me, accusing me of my life with her extra finger, whirling in a jeer of rage at what my days had, had to come. What I plead with her, I could do, or what could I have done? And she twisted her wild hair and sparkled her wild eyes and screamed as long as I could hear her. This, this, this. Okay. So if you look at this poem, I can imagine, and I don't know if we have time to do this, but um, one thing, I'm going to have you take this home with you and do it, 
is to write a poem using her title and her first line. And maybe even her title, which is the first line, but also the first line of the poem. It was a dream in which my greater self, just that idea, what is our greater self? I don't know. But your greater self did what? That's like a great prompt for you, a great beginning of something. What happened? What did your greater self do? And if you want, you can make the poem this long, a true imitation would make it the same length, more or less the same length lines, even that one word line, um, that ending, you know, you could steal that uh, if you want. But the rest of it would be you, would be something about you. It was a dream in which my greater self did what? What did you, what do you want to say about that, you know? Um, I mean, I know, you know, I'm the kind of person every day I want to do better, be better. What, what, what's my greater self, you know, rising up to accuse <coughs> me of in this case? Or it could be doing something completely out different than that. Um, but this is a really, a poem that's a really good prompt. Um, go to the last page. Or does anybody have any thoughts or questions about that? Go to the last page to Lee Young Lee. Um, I love you, Lee Young Lee. A lot of him is narrative, even though over the years he's turning less narrative. Um, but this one's pretty narrative. But he also does some really interesting things here. And just the idea of the gift. What is a gift in this poem? Um, and, and once you read it and you realize what the gift was, um, then that's something else that you could imitate as well. So um, I'm going to read this one to you. The gift. To pull the metal splinter from my palm, my father recited a story in a low voice. I watched his lovely face and not the blade. Before the story ended, he'd removed the iron sliver I thought I'd die from. I can't remember the tale, but hear his voice still. A well of dark water, a prayer. And I recall his hands, two measures of tenderness he laid up against my face, the flames of discipline he raised above my head. Had you entered that afternoon, you would have thought you saw a man planting something in a boy's palm, a silver tear, a tiny flame. Had you followed that boy, you would have arrived here where I bend over my wife's right hand. Look how I shave her thumbnail down so carefully she feels no pain. Watch as I lift the splinter out. I was seven when my father took my hand like this, and I did not hold that shard between my fingers and think, metal that will bury me, christen it little assassin or going deep for my heart. And I did not lift up my wound and cry, death visited here. I did what a child does when he's given something to keep. I kissed my father. I love this poem. <laughs> I love what it does. And this is something that you can do as well. He starts with a, me with a memory, right? Something that happened when he was seven. And then look in that, that third stanza, the very middle of the poem. What he does there, how he goes into something else. That's something you could do there also at a certain point. Had you entered that afternoon, had you, you know, been there at that memory, you might have thought this or you might have thought that. And then he brings it to the present. Look how I shave her thumbnail. He's also doing something for his wife in this case. And then he goes back at the end to the memory. So we have a kind of frame that goes back from the beginning to the end. You know when you're watching a movie and they play a certain uh, music at the beginning or they show a certain scene and then when you see it again at the begin at the end or you hear that music, you know it's the end. That's called a frame. They're framing it. And that's what he does here. He goes back to that memory and provides that frame. And that's very satisfying. 
You know, like you all know about story, how you have a beginning, a middle, and the end. I often tell my students in their conclusions, go back to your introduction, go back to your hook or your thesis, go back to something from the beginning and bring it back to the end. And then you will have a satisfying closure there. Um, so the poems, you know, do the same thing. Stories do the same thing there. What was the gift here? Anyone tell me what the gift is? I mean, I have my idea of what the gift is. What do you think the gift is? Care. Caring, yeah, the care, the memory. You know, this memory of his father, a memory of this care is exactly what, what I thought of the love, you know, that his father showed him. You know, his father wasn't perfect. He also used those hands to discipline him, apparently. But, but it's still, you know, it's still a, a wonderful memory. And this was the gift. This was what he was given here. But this is something you can, uh, you can imitate as well. Okay. Um, and, you know, you can do the same thing with the Natasha Trethewey pro, uh, poem. Uh, here she has, uh, in this case, a father also. Uh, telling the certain story, and the way she does that is something that, that you could do as well. So all of those are, are just some nice examples for you. So um, we just have a few more minutes, is that okay? We just have a, yeah. you could do the raffle and. Okay, okay. Um, I was just gonna read a couple poems and then we'll, we'll do that. So I'm just gonna read um, a couple of, uh, poems of mine. Um, I also wanted to show you um, the latest places that I was published in. I publish a lot. Um, uh, journals are often online now, so there's just a, a lot of online publishing, but occasionally we get the hard copy. All, also, uh, the hard copy. This actually came out at the end of last year. It's called Two Countries, U.S. Daughters and Sons of Immigrant Parents. Um, and it's a really nice um, anthology, and there's also, there's some privilege to having a last name that begins with an A sometimes. <laughs> I'm at the beginning, and they did a really nice job of providing like a heritage statement and a bio, and then I have a couple of poems here. And this one's called Cartography After Neruda. So I showed you my Pablo Neruda book, so I imitated. I don't write like Pablo Neruda, but I did for this poem. I imitated his style um, and his use of nature and things like that. And here's another one just called Exile. Uh, and it's just about you know feeling like, like an exile. Um, this one also came out this year, just this fall. And this has to do with food. Uh, Vinegar and Char um, is, and it was published by University of Georgia Press. Um, and it's part of this institute at uh, the University of Mississippi, um, which is called the Southern Foodways Alliance. And it's an institute that just has all kinds, they have a journal and they do all kinds of things related to food. So um, I have a poem in here, actually an older poem that is also at the end of my, my book called Why It's Delicious. And, and that taps into, all, every stanza is like a memory of why something was delicious. And it was basically because, you know, my mother cooked it, or my grandmother picked it, or, you know, or something like that. That made it more delicious. Um, uh, so I have that one. And then this is something called a zine, which was like a really quickly published kind of magazine that I heard somebody was doing. And I sent her a couple of newish poems. I don't like to send new work because I'm not done revising it. You know, I feel, even though I think I'm done, I know I'm not. So I don't like, but I sent it because um, it had a theme. It's called The Politics of Shelter. So just however we wanted to interpret that. Um, but I have, um, the second poem here is called If I Should. And this is actually a poem that is an imitation of a Lucille Clifton poem called If I Should. She actually has like three of them. Um, so it's a, and I put here, after Lucille Clifton's uh, If I Should to Clark Kent. She actually writes it to Superman, you know, to Clark Kent. Um, I did mine to Mike Pence. You can imagine what the subject might be. Um, but it's definitely uh, political. But I, I imitate her um, there. And just to show you where, um, you know, poems come from sometimes. This, uh, the other poem in here is called ID Note, 
And it basically um, is based on, I was listening to NPR, to National Public Radio, and they're very detailed. Um, there's actually an anthology of NPR poems. People get inspired by NPR all the time. And, um, and I was listening, and I put a quote from NPR, staying alive in Kabul is an accident. Um, and this was, um, they were doing a story about Afghanistan and Kabul and all the bombs that go off all the time. And how people have taken to putting a, a note in their pocket. And so they said what was on that note. And so I scattered it through the poem because if you get blown up, that note might get scattered as well. But then I put them all together at the bottom. And so basically it says, bomb blast after bomb blast and then i put in parentheses my father's name men have taken to placing a folded phone number piece of white paper a small white paper and address in a pocket to read it you have to find it my id number pieces of it in bomb blast debris look for it my blood type the note will say, here is my father's name, the phone number of a close relative, my address, my ID number, my blood type, my blood. It will say, here I am, or here I was. So, thank you. So that's one of the, the later ones. And I'm going to just finish up by um, showing you, if you are interested in publishing, the first thing you have to do is write. <laughs> and not worry about it. And write for a long time. And read. Read a lot. And don't worry about publishing because you will get to it. And take workshops. Um, yes, go ahead. How do you deal with writer's block? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I recommend, you know, if you're writing something and you can't, you feel like you can't write, I recommend just journaling. Just really journaling a lot and reading a lot. I, I recommend those things more than anything. And sometimes you have to take a break, you know, and refresh yourself doing other other things and then come back to it. So like take a break or decide um, research what you're going to write about or just... Yeah, write it in a different way or research what you're writing about. That that will work also. I brought a couple of books and when we're done you can all come and look at these. Um, this is an excellent little book I use in my creative writing class called The Poet's Companion. It's very accessible, has wonderful poems in it. And they have a little section on writer's block also um, at the end of that. This is a great book called... Um, a, gotten this from my class sometimes, it's called The Practice of Poetry, and it's writing exercises by poets who teach. And so every, it begins, the beginning ones are kind of brainstorming type, you know, uh, exercises, and then the lot, you know, the ending ones are more revising type, and all of those, um, uh, and they're just ideas, prompts, you know, exercises to get you writing. And if you take my class, I will always give you something to work with. You know, you'll always have, and, and then I do like open ones too, but um, I like to give you ideas. So those are, are two books I, I highly recommend. And then my trusty thesaurus, okay? I love this Roger's thesaurus. This is about my third one. I've destroyed a couple of them already. Um, and I just think this is a genius thesaurus because sometimes you don't know what word you want. And so you think, well, it's kind of like this. So you look that up. And then it will tell you, see also. And that's what will give you the idea. You can write a poem based on this thesaurus because there's a lot of found poems in there. And then there are magazines, like uh, this is the Bible of writers. It's called Poets and Writers. Um, a lot of good articles, but at the end is where like the classifieds are and people asking for poems and themes and stories and novels and things like that. So I highly recommend you can get these at Barnes and Noble um, or go online and just uh, reading other things, you know, can be helpful as well. And finally, I brought a couple. Uh, you guys can take these. Um, 
And this is, you know, when you're a little bit more advanced or if you want to go as an auditor, um, you know, just to observe and you can afford it. These are uh, major poetry conferences, the Palm Beach Poetry Conference. But you can go to the readings. Um, they do charge for it, but you can go to the readings and not necessarily do the workshops. I'm doing that this year in January. This is another one, Writers in Paradise. It's uh, on the west coast of Florida from a lot of uh, teachers from FIU will be doing that. You can take that. But right in our backyard this weekend is the Miami Book Fair. And this was in the newspaper. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that you go to the book fair. Um, if you want to talk to me about it, I can tell you how to go and where to park for free. Okay, <laughs> and you just go there. I would go like Saturday morning, you know, middle mid morning or something. You park, and there's you know, take your student ID. It'll only be like five bucks. Uh, you go in, and then you can go to all the readings, all these authors who published in the last year, poets, all different kinds. There's a whole fair in Spanish. Um, uh, and, and also there's a big uh, emphasis on Caribbean writers this year. Um, so this is Saturday and Sunday. It's the largest book fair of its kind in the world. There is no book fair bigger than this. They close off all the streets, and this is their 35th year. So you've been missing it, so go get started. Um, their 35th year, um, they close up all the streets right across from Bayside in downtown Miami. Uh, around Miami. It's all on the uh, Wolfson campus of Miami-Dade College. So I highly recommend going to this. Even if you don't know who the writers are, uh, go to the first building. You can pick up um, a book fair guide and then just go in, you know, just go see whoever. If you don't like them, just sneak out quietly. Um, <laughs> but you'll discover wonderful writers. They sell all kinds of books and the best time to buy books is at 4 o'clock on Sunday when all the publishers want to pack up. Then they put their books on sale, so there's a little tip there. Um, but anyway, I recommend that, that you go there. Okay, now I'm done and ready for the raffle. All right. Uh, all right. And also, if you, if you have any questions after this, I'm happy to um, hang around and, and answer your questions. Mike, you had a question, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I want to source um, a site. How much do I need a source? A site. You want to um a, a source of site like get uh anything from the site and try to source it like like according to blah blah how much do you, I need to like source it? In a in a poem? No, in a um essay. In an essay? So in an essay, um so how do you cite it? No, I mean um how much? Because like it, it takes like four or five sentences. Right. Is that too much or that's too little? It depends. You know, sometimes we have short, mm -hmm. we have short quotes, and sometimes we have longer um, quotes. And as long as it's all relevant, mm -hmm. you can, you know, there's, if you have a one that's longer than four lines, you can. There's a way to present it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it really depends on your, you know, what you're being, what you're trying to say. Okay. Um, but if it's all relevant, you can cite it all. But if you only need a few words, then. Shorter is usually better. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Continue the questions after the raffle. Okay. Uh, so. All righty. So the first one is. And the winner is. Shama August. August. Shama August. Is she here? She's not here. She's not here. No. Okay. Do they have Somebody to be else. here? Somebody else then. Okay. Here we go. They have to be here. Okay. <laughs> okay. And Rosie. Kenna. Kenna. She left. She okay. Left okay. okay. Hey. Should. More chances for you guys. Good for you guys. Okay. The bush. Uh, bush. Just. Just. Woo! 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 Immigrant story mostly, a lot of narratives, and this concludes narratives too. But these are more elegies. These are poems that I collected. I realized at one point that I had a lot of poems. Actually, I have enough for a full collection. This is called a chapbook when it's a smaller, under 40 pages. Um, but these are um, when you write because somebody has died, and so you write about it. And it's about it's personal, but it's also public. Like when I read about something in the Miami Herald. I write about it. Like, I keep writing about those poor little children that keep getting suffocated in cars. You know, I can't stand that. Every time I read that, I go crazy. So I have a poem called Hot Step Cars. Right. Yeah. So which one do you want? Uh, 
The great one. Okay. And this is to come up towards the signature. Oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> and. Okay. And the winner is Michael E. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Michael, come back afterwards for the signature. Here you go. Oh, Good job. Good. Suspense, suspense. Uh huh. Okay. She when Lan. She? Yeah. <laughs> And the winner is Jose Camacho. Jose? Jose? No. Okay. Jose. 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 There it is. Oh, yeah. All right. Jose. 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 Uh -huh. My pleasure. Okay. So now take advantage and ask the author for a signature, guys. I'm happy to do that. Does anyone else have questions? All right, if you have individual ones, I'm happy to, um, to answer them. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.